بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا الإلماء اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جأوته سهلا وأنت تجعل الهزن إذا شئت سهلا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم أسأل الله تبارك وتعالى أن يجعل نياتنا خالصة لوجه الكريم إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to continue in reading the translator's introduction Dr. Mustafa Badawi uh, to the three treaties of Imam al-Haddad, inshallah. So we left off on page number 11 of the translator's introduction. Introduction. So inshallah, we'll continue. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. The author, may Allah ta'ala have mercy on him, said, Obviously, they must exchange greetings of peace, inquire about each other's health, family, and other affairs, for this keeps the bonds of brotherly affection alive. Mm. Having done so, they should turn to reminding each other, excuse me, of that which infuses their lives with the fragrance of faith and renders, by Allah Ta'ala's will, their life to come successful. So here, really, the ultimate gain, the ultimate aim of brotherhood is to guide each other to Allah, right? And if I ask one thing for all of us, seriously, find it in your heart, because that's where everything starts, at the level of the heart, where the most important thing to you is saving yourselves and others from the hellfire and earning your way to Al-Jannah in the pleasure of Allah. And every means that facilitates that make it something you strive to attain. That's your life goal. So when you're with people, listen, I want to get you away from the hellfire into Jannah under the pleasure of Allah wa ta'ala. And whatever we can do to facilitate that, let's do it, right? That, that, that is the objective. I want us all, we want us all to be winners on the day of judgment, right? And we put all our energy into doing that. Nothing is more important than helping us to become winners on the day of judgment, to escape the everlasting torture of the hellfire and enter the everlasting enjoyments in Al-Jannah. So the whole matter is what? It ends like this. Ahl al-Nar yadakhulun al-Nar wa ahl al-Jannah yadakhulun al-Jannah. It's over. Wow, that's where it ends. The people of the hellfire enter the hellfire. The people of paradise enter paradise. It's over, done. Subhanallah, think about that. Just think about that for a minute. What is the end? Ahl al-Nar yadukhulun al-Nar. Ahl al-Jannah yadukhulun al-Jannah. Wow. That's the reality. If you ended the hellfire forever, You'll be in that to be punished if you die in the state of kufr to no end.
la yamutu fiha wa la yahya. They won't die in that. It won't end the punishment. And they're not going to have a joyous life. And the people of paradise enter paradise. Close. That's it. Don't forget that while you're alive. That's the reality of it. All this means nothing. It's going to, where it's going to end you. If it doesn't result in your ending being in the, of the people of Jannah who enter Jannah, you are a loser. So make sure that's your end. Make sure you take everything that's in your ability, every tool you have, every resource you have, every asset you have to be min alil jannah alladhina yadkhulun al jannah. The people of paradise, those who will enter the paradise. Everything you got, put it into that. Do your best to escape hellfire. That's how you're going to be successful in the life to come. Subhanallah. Allah told us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ku anfusikum, anfusakum wa ahlikum. Save yourselves and your family. Allah. That's one to just think about for a long time. How are we going to be safe? Hmm. How are we going to be safe? A fire whose fuel is men and stones. Now, go ahead. Here, don't forget your ending so your beginning is good and your middle is good. Right? A lot of times we don't think about the ending. We stuck in the middle or in the beginning. La, 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 la. If you realize where you want to end, it will be much easier for you to fix your beginning and your middle. When you think often about how I'm going to end. Hence the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, have abundant mention in remembrance of the destroyer of pleasures, al maut death. It's going to destroy the pleasures. All of it is going away, everything, death when it comes. That's reality, yaqeen, sincere certainty. It's coming. And what is after death is the beginning of real life. Death, al-maut, is the beginning of real life. Subhanallah. We didn't even really get started. You want the evidence for that? Want some dalil? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
He said the lifespan of his nation is between 60 and 70 years. That's the lifespan of the nation of Sayyiduna Muhammad. Some die early, some live a little older, but this is the average. So 60, 70 years. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived to be 63. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tayyip, 60, 60, 60, 70 years. After we die, the first part of the journey to everlasting life, either in everlasting enjoyment or everlasting everlasting wretchedness everlasting felicity or everlasting wretchedness all of it is everlasting not coming to an end if you are ultimately of the people in Jannah everlasting felicity and happiness and if you are of the losers, the people of hellfire, ashakawatul abadiyya, everlasting wretchedness. So we live 60, 70 years. Some of us get a little more, some of us get that's average. So even if we lived a hundred, subhanAllah. We die. The first stage after that. Is Alam al Barzakh, Al Hayatul Barzakiya, the life in the grave, the intermediate realm. And that lasts from the time you die to the day of resurrection. And Allah knows best when this world is going to come to an end. So there are people in Alam Barzakh in the realm of the intermediate world since the time of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam to today. So uh, from Adam and Sheath and Noor and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa, all of the names, Suleiman, Dawood, all of those MBA, all of those people who lived, all of them in Alam al barzakh Thousands of years. In that realm. So you only live 60, 70 years. Even you live to 100. Just the life in the grave, which is Alam Barzakh, the world of the intermediate world. That life can be hundreds and thousands of years. For some, there is Naim al-Qabr. There's the enjoyment of the grave. For others, there's Adab al-Qabr. There's the punishment of the grave. And various stages, even when the body is the, 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 uh, decays, there is still others in for the soul and other matters. Then, Yom al Ba'ath, the day of resurrection. And after that, from the time you're resurrected, we come out of the grave. That stage, Yom al Qiyamah, 50,000 years of which we count. 50,000 years of what we count. After the long life in the grave, whether in enjoyment or in torture, depending who you are and how you died, then you have 50,000 year journey for the day of judgment. 50,000 years of which we count. You only live for 160, 70, 80, 
50,000 years for the day of judgment. Reflect. This is our dean. Reflect on it. 50,000 years. For whatever we did in those 100 years or 50 years or 60 years or 70 years or less, some of us will be accounting for 50,000 years. For the believers, it will go fast. Done. For the righteous. But for those who have sins that they have to account for, it may be a long day. 50,000 years of which we can. And we don't know how much Allah is going to take us. It's a hisab. It's reckoning. Right? It's reckoning. And then after that, depending if you were successful or a loser, you got an everlasting life that doesn't come to an end. I remember one time, sometimes I think, and I, I remember some stuff that we studied with Sheikh Walid. I wish you would have had the, the time to spend with him when he was young. He's older now, right? But when he was younger, he was on fire, subhanAllah. He used to describe to us, I don't even know if he can do it like that anymore, right? He used to describe to us the day of judgment. And honestly, the way he would describe it we could picture it as if it was right standing on the day of judgment. The way he used to explain. And I'm going back a long time ago, right? Over two decades when he used to explain. I don't know. Maybe I, see, I'm longing for you now he's old and calm and you know. <laughs> I remember Sheikh Wali when he was. Quick, fast, boom, 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 boom. So one time he was describing to us the verse. Yakulu kafiru ya leitani kuntu taraba. Yakulu kafiru ya leitani kuntu turaba. On that day, Yakulu kafiru, the disbeliever will say, Ya leitani kuntu turaba. Woe is me, I wish I was dust. Subhanallah. This is Sheikh Walid explaining. I remember it. That was, like I said, it's like two decades ago. But the way he explained it, it stuck in my mind and it just came like boom. He said, You know why they're going to say that on the day of judgment? This is Yom al Hisab. Everyone's on Al Ardu Mubaddala, the transform earth. There are no mountains, there are no valleys. Flat, right? Flat plain. So this earth will be destroyed and turned into a flat earth where it's flat and everyone will be assembled. And the animals would be judged who harm one another. They're going to get reckoned, right? So the horn animal who, hit, who banged the one without a horn, the one without the horn is going to take recompense from that one, right? And when they're finished giving the rights between the animals, they're all going to turn to dust. The humans, they're going to be standing there watching that because everything's on the flat plane. Everyone could be seen. 
And when the Kafir sees that, he's going to say, Ya laytani kuntu turaba. Woe is me. I wish I could be dust. Wow. Put your mind there. You see on the earth, you watch nature, and you see sometimes they ham and the animals harming. They're going to get their rights on the day of judgment. No one will be unjustly treated. Even the animals who were wrongly attacked by the other animals, they're going to take retribution. So what about humans? What about humans? This is animals. What about us when we do each other wrong? On the day of judgment, no one's going to be, even the Kafir you did wrong, gonna get their rights. No injustice. Nothing's gonna be left. So imagine this situation the sun is one mile from the earth, that flat earth. And the people are in their sweat. The sweat will go deep into the earth, fill up, and then come back. And some people will be to their ankles. Some people will be to their shins. Some people will be to their knees. Some people will be to their waist. Some people will be to their chest. Give me one second, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Some people will be to their chest. Some people will be to their chin. Some people will drown in their sweat. Some people will drown in their sweat. Subhanallah. And you know, he said, You know, in this world, everyone worry about being scandalized, right? It's called al fadiha right? They don't want to be scandalized. He said, in this world, your scandal is only going to be how popular you are. So if you know a lot of people know you like a star or something, maybe they'll put it on the TV, on entertainment tonight or some stuff like that, and it'll last to the next scandal come, right? If you're not that popular, a few of your friends might know about it, maybe your family. It's So this is a small scandal, no matter who you are, in terms of even if a lot of people know you, it's still a small scandal. Even if you're a famous person in the world, the amount of people who are going to pay attention to that scandal is small. He said, on the day of judgment, all of the humans from the time of Adam to the last person to die before the day of judgment, all of them are going to see your stuff. He said, that's the real major scandal. And no big thing or little thing will be hidden. So even if you escape this light scandal and you hide, remember there's going to be the hisab, the reckoning, the displaying of the deeds in front of the entire nations of all the prophets.
from Adam to Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Everyone's going to see. Now you see, while that Kafir who is standing in that, the hellfire is dragged to the place of judgment by the Malaika, thousands of them pulling the fire, raging, so they see it. We're trying to be successful on that day. We're trying to be winners on that day. That's what we're working at, to escape the disgrace on that day. That's why they should turn their attention to reminding each other of that which is infuses their life with the fragrance of faith and renders by Allah's will their life to come successful. That's the life to come. That's what we need to be reminding each other. I got to be a winner on the day of judgment. I cannot be a loser. We have to win. Subhanallah. Naam, go ahead. Hmm. As for the learned men and women of the Muslim nation, they are the ones primarily intended by Allah to Allah's command and remind for reminding the prophets, the believers. Who is better qualified than these learned and godly people to obey this order and strive to carry it out with substance, wisdom, and in the most befitting manner? Mm. Imam Abdullah al Haddad was such a learned man. His was Imam a Abdullah al Haddad, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Imam al Haddad. He died in the year 1132 after Hijra. He was the Mujaddid, the renewer of the religion of his time, the knower of Allah, the great scholar, and the great traveler on the path to Allah. His was a life infused with the love of his brother Muslims and an unrivaled capacity to remind them of Allah Ta'ala, his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the last day. He's very present. Allah said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا There is an excellent example for you in the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whoever لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ Who? Whoever, for whoever has their raja, has their hope for Allah and the last day and remembers Allah much. Imam al Haddad remind us about Allah, His Messenger, and the last day. That's the reality of this traveling. Mm. His very presence was a constant reminder to those around him, as well as to as well as to those who only heard or read about his counsel on how a Muslim should behave toward his Lord and his brother Muslim. Because he was one of those, when you see him, you remember Allah. And all of us should strive to be people. When people see us, they remember Allah. The first of these three concise books contained in this volume is known as The Treaties of Mutual Reminding Among Loving Brothers, People of Goodness and Religion. It was the Imam's first work, dictated in 1069 AH, when he was 25 years of age. 
Look at that. So this is the first book of Imam Haddad. It's the first book we're going to read in this. I was 25 when he wrote this book. And notice it was dictated, right? Which means Imam Haddad didn't write. He would dictate from his mind to his students. He was 25. When we read this text and you see what's in it, you'll see the level of Imam al-Haddad. Because Imam al-Haddad, when he was a child, let me show you Imam al-Haddad. When he was a young boy in the Quran school, he used to pray optional prayers after school, 200 raka a day. Optional. Finish school and make 200 raka of optional prayers. Besides all the sunnah prayers and the obligatory prayers, just extra 200 raka a day. As a kid, he wasn't even pubescent at that time. A young boy between Tamiz and Buluk, dis, dis, you know, mental discrimination and puberty, he was doing that. Not just him, his friends with him. They were competing one another as kids who could pray the most. Because that was the environment they lived in. They saw pious and righteous people. He used to go to all the, the various masajid in Tareen. And they had hundreds of masjids, little small mosques, big mosques. And he would go all of them and pray in every single one of them. To all the masjids in Tareen, he prayed in them in his time. He prayed in all of them. So now by the time he's 25, he's dictating books from his memory. Bring the scribe and he just go and they write. And, and when you read and you see what was in his mind at 25, one of the scholars in the Zawiya of uh, Al-Akbar. He told me when I visited that place in Tareen, that Zawiya, very interesting story. One day I'll tell you about that, that Zawiya and some of the things. It was very interesting. He, he told me because that is in old Tareen, not where Darul Mustafa is. This old Tareen. Right? Uh, and Masjid Ba Alawi and all of that places are, right? Ribat Tareen in that area. The, the person who runs the Azawiya, he said to me, he was telling me about Al Imam Aydarus, Abdullah bin Abi Bakr al Sukran, Aydarus al Akbar, right? Radiallahu ta'ala. Oh, I named my son after him. <laughs> Aydarus. Two Aydarus, but he's one. Hoping that he would be like him. Inshallah. May Allah give him that. He was telling me that that area around Masjid Ba Alawi, it used to be like an enclosed area where they would raise their children and they would not let them leave the area until they started to get little hairs around their puberty. He said they would not let them leave the area. So one of the ways of the path of Asad about Alawi is they don't allow the kids to mix with others, right? They protect them. So no going to the marketplace, none of that when they were kids. He said they didn't let them out of that area until they were like pubescent, they begin to get some hairs. He said, look what he said, Ajib. He said, and when they were that, why they would let them out? Because that time they were from Ahlil Kashf. 
They were people of divine unveiling. So they didn't have to worry about them. <laughs> Subhanallah. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. He said they were Ahlul Kashf, you don't have to worry about them anymore. They are protected. They are great awliya. They're, they just turned pubescent, but they are awliya already. So they could protect themselves. <laughs> so you see Imam Haddad at 25, he's already a wali of Allah. La ilaha illallah. Subhanallah. That's amazing. What if we worked hard to establish communities that resemble something like that in our areas? Where we could say that about our children. By the time they pubescent, they're all awliya of Allah already. Al kashf You know what that means? That means they have divine unveiling. That means they can see things that are not visible for others. This unveiled. One time Imam al-Haddad, you know he was blind. So there was, he was out one time and there was a man, he wanted to get close to Imam al-Haddad. But Imam al-Haddad, he used to, in those days, he was uh, uh, like one who was obscure. He didn't like to meet people. He would like, you know, hide. And he didn't want no one to know who he was, right? Like his status. So this one, he saw Imam al-Haddad, and Imam al-Haddad, he was blind. You know, Imam al-Haddad was blind in the eyes, not in the heart. His basira was wide open. So when Imam al-Haddad noticed him, he noticed he doesn't see, and he had his back turned. He noticed the man trying to reveal who he was. He went to get away, and he ran and hurry up to catch Imam al-Haddad. And he had Imam Haddad. He said to Imam Haddad, Does the Wali have anything like the Prophet? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Haddad said to him, Yes, he can see from behind him just like he sees in front of him. <laughs> Allah, Allahu Akbar. He says, does the Wali have any miraculous thing like the prophets? Imam Haddad, because he caught Imam Haddad. And Imam Haddad, he said, yes. He can see from behind him just like he sees in front of him. In other words, Kesh, I knew you were coming. That's why I tried to get away from you. <laughs> now, don't reveal my secrets. SubhanAllah. That's the state of this conversation, right? All right, you know I didn't see you, but I saw you. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. There's an awliya of Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu said about them, beware of that spiritual insight of the believer because he sees with the light of Allah. Beware of that inner sight of the believer because he sees with the light of Allah. Subhanallah. May Allah make us lovers of the awliya and in their company by our love for them, insha'Allah. Naam, go ahead. In it, he examines mutual reminding and the exchange of good counsel. 
identifies its chief elements as taqwa, or fear of Allah Ta'ala, and detachment from worldly things. He defines taqwa according to the... So here we're going to talk about two things. At taqwa wa zuhud. At taqwa wa zuhud. That's the focus. He's 25. You got to pay attention. This is a young man. And look at the asrar and the ma'arif coming from Imam Haddad at 25. And we'll read the book. We're going to go through it. But just pay attention. At 25, what is he concerned about? Taqwa of Allah and a zuhud for dunya. Being mindful and aware of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala by performing your obligations and refraining from the sins and a zuhud for dunya. Being detached from this world. He's 25. What is the 25-year-old thinking about in our time? How much dunya I got to get? He's 25, detachment from dunya. That's his concern at 25. And he's a spiritual master. Ooh. Go ahead. He defines taqwa according to the criteria of Imam al-Ghazali and delineates both its active aspect of doing good and its passive aspect of avoiding evil. He then discusses the four things that impair it, ignorance, weakness of faith, long hopes, and illicit and dubious sustenance. Mm. He goes on next to, to discuss two of the major obstacles on the path of obedience, namely conceit and ostentation, both of which seriously assail one's sincerity. Al-Ujib wal-Riya. Al-Ujib wal-Riya. Being amazed with yourself and ostentation. And this is all summaries of what Imam al-Ghazali said. So he's taking what Imam al-Ghazali spoke of in Al-Ihya and he's summarizing it for people. He's 25. Making it practical for the common Muslim. La ilaha Allah. Mm. Finally, he speaks of how the love of this world severs one from Allah to Allah, quoting numerous chronic verses, prophetic traditions, and the saying of the virtuous predecessors among the early and venerable Muslim generations. So pay attention to what, at 25, what's on his mind, what he's advising to his students. He's already a sheikh and a teacher and a master, a spiritual master. So we should take him. The importance of a taqwa, a zuhud, avoiding al jahl, ignorance, weakness of faith, longing hopes like you're not going to die, be prepared to die, don't have long hopes, right? Avoid doubtful things, avoid self amazement and showing off, and don't fall in love with this world. He's 25. Look at his mind. Now he's 25 doing this. I want you to pay attention to this. Imam Haddad lived to be 88. He's 25. He lived to be 88. So you're talking about from that point, 63 more years of guiding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the lifespan of the Prophet wasallam? From his first writing, dictating his first book, to his death, the time of the life of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wow. These are the type of people we want to try to emulate. These are the type of people we want to get just a taste of their realities.
And now you see why it's so important to train our children well, to raise them well. It's extremely important. We can't just read about exceptional people. We have to become exceptional people. But we learn about them by reading about them, by emulating those who've been connected with them so that one day we become like them. And even if we cannot become like them, we must love them. Because loving them may be the means for their intercession for us on that day of standing where people are saying, yeah, late Tani Kuntu Turaba. Woe is me, I wish I was thus. But if we love these pious people and try our best to emulate them, even though we are not like them, maybe on that day, they will be those who stand to relieve us from such horrors. May Allah make it easy for us, inshallah. We'll stop here. I remind you tonight, we continue with uh, Imam Al-Maydani's uh, with Sheikh Walid. Uh, please, please, please. Unfortunately, we're out of the books, they're all gone. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, which is a good thing. The books we are got them in their hands. So, I have to, inshallah, I'll have to bring some more from overseas. That's going to take a while because. Uh, the one, our student who uh, goes and send me is in Tareem right now. And these books are in Egypt. So I have to wait till he comes back from Tareem to go back to Egypt, which inshallah will be next month sometime. Uh, inshallah, then I'll bring some more books. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's it's uh, they're gone. People, I told you, get right on it. They got right on it. Uh, but alhamdulillah. So don't delay. Let me tell you a lesson about books. I'm a book lover, so take my advice, please. My life is books, right? Don't say I'm going to get it tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow it may be gone. And you will regret tomorrow when you realize you delayed. Never put off for tomorrow what you can do today. That's a book lesson. Never do that. Whenever it's available and you have the means, grab it. Even if you're not going to use it today. Put it up. Because one day you're going to need it and it's not going to be available. And a lot of times with books, they go out of stock. And that's it. They're not coming back. You shot. Don't do that. And if you're a real lover, books are priceless. Beneficial books are priceless. Sometimes they go out of print, and that's it. Sometimes books get lost. When I have a good book, my family will tell you, I don't have one. I have one in this house, one in this house, one in the masjid, one in this house, one in the car. I have several copies. Why? Because sometimes you misplace books, stuff happen, someone come, they want to learn, you love them, you lend them a book, the book is gone, la, 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 I, 
Don't be, be cheap on everything else. Don't be cheap on that which is going to make you a winner on the day of judgment. Be cheap on other stuff, not that. My first love is my books, then my wife. <laughs> okay, keep it up. You're going to be sleeping with your books. <laughs> I know the feeling, Jafar. <laughs> I would never say such a thing. It's well known, but I would never say it, right? <laughs> you said it, I didn't, right? <laughs> no, seriously, don't cheat yourself with that. And you should read and study and review and do it and do it and do it. And I don't, I don't like PDFs. I got to have a hard book. I got to have a hard back. I need, a book has a secret. I don't know, give me no PDF, computer stuff. Look, put the book in my hand. I have some stuff. Imam, I need to buy one of your copies. Alazat, Miki. You know what that means? Alazat, Miki. You're a female. Who knows what that means? Tell her what I just said. She said, I mean, hey, ma'am, I need to buy one of your copies. Alazat, Mickey. Oh, let's see. Come on, help us out. What does that mean, y'all? She ain't get it. Did you get it, Amari? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't it means no, but not it has another meaning too. He said never in essence. Yeah, Alezamiki. It means, so you think, <laughs> which is absolutely not, <laughs> you know. But don't worry, sister, I got you covered. Somehow, some way, just not mine. So <laughs> let me stop. <laughs> but I got you. We're going to figure it all out. Uh... Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Now, we knock somebody out. We don't want no trouble. Get her a book. No, inshallah, we're going to get some. I got you covered. Don't worry, I got you covered. I got your back. Uh, but honestly, Keep it like that. Now I got you covered. We're gonna get, we're gonna hook you up somehow, some way. Uh, so I appreciate you all. Forget so don't forget tonight. So even that right now, just take good notes because we're gonna get more books, inshallah. And we'll get them out as soon as possible because that's the first thing. When he gets back to Reem, that's A number one. Go get the books, the Shuru of Akira Tahawi, and send them to me. Uh, so, because that's going to be for the next couple months. And it's very important that everyone follows. And the book, and like I said, that book, I need that copy because it has vowels. If you can't read Arabic, it's not going to help. It's going to be difficult because the other copies that I got, there's no vowels like these, there's no vowels on it. But that other copy, the one I had, it is all vowed. So it's easier for you to follow and it'll help you learn Arabic as well. So inshallah, uh, may Allah reward you all. I enjoy your company. May Allah really, y'all are great. All of you are a great blessing in my life. You know, I really appreciate you. You help me 
do something that I've always had a desire to do, right? To be every day living this and learning and reading books and because it's hard to get people to be steadfast to do all this. But y'all have shown a strong commitment. So we're able to go and go and go. And I was telling Sheikh Walid that last night. I said, they with us. They ready to go. Let's move. Let's one step, step. We want to get to where we covering book after book after book after book. Big books, major books. Let's go. Let's go. Like we used to do. When we were in our striving, striving, that's what we used to do. So all we got to do is keep going, you know, right? And make it a habit in, in amongst us, right? Everyone want to sit with teachers and read books and learn and study and practice and love and be brothers and sisters. Like, that's, that's, that's our dean. That's how the Sahaba were. They used to sit around and and we, we and remind each other and learn and acquire. If I don't miss nothing from overseas, is that from Fajr to Isha, we would be learning, reminding, being supporting one another. Wake up first thing in the morning. I give you the day. That's how it works. Get up in the morning. Most of the times I was with my sheikh, right? So we get up in the morning, pray some optional raka, kiyama lay type right before, then walk to the masjid, right? Sometimes it'd be freezing cold, walk to the masjid. We go to the masjid, especially in, in, in Lebanon, it's like a beautiful way they do it in this masjid. You walk to the masjid, Everybody comes in the masjid, reading Quran, uh, doing what we would do. Then the imam comes, pray the salah. Then after the salah, no one leaves the masjid. Everyone makes weird together. So we would like do Hizbun Nawawi. That was the weird we used to do in the morning after Fajr. Everyone in the masjid is reciting the weird Imam al Nawawi. Everybody. Look at this beautiful way how they would end. So we finish. After we do the weird of al Nawawi, then everyone would stand up and no one leaves the masjid except everyone shakes everybody's hand and greets everyone. So we would line up and then they would just come. One by one, shake everyone's hand and then leave the masjid. Everyone's hand. So it would just go around to everyone in the masjid, shook everyone's hand, said, Assalamu alaikum, and then everyone would go out. It's beautiful stuff, right? Then the sheikh would go and we would leave there and go to the graveyard. Well, this is in the Islamic environment so we would walk to the graveyard and then make dua for the deceased and read surah yasin on different for different people then go have breakfast then classes learning after the classes rest then visiting shuyuk Visiting neighbors, visiting brothers and sisters in Islam, go visit. Lessons to Maghrib, Awrad, to Isha. And then little lessons, things, adhkar, different things, going to Mawalid, going to, you know, celebrations uh, of dhikr and salah al nabi. Then home at night some prayers, some tea, some drinking, some talk, and the same thing the next morning. <laughs> SubhanAllah. We can make our environments like that. Some are working too. Not everyone's doing the same thing, but they're working and then they stop. They come to the prayer. You, you know, because different people got different stuff. We're students, so you don't do all that, right? But a nice life, man. We can make an environment like that. And there are some like that. 
right? But we need more, right? This is nice. It don't have to be all dunya your whole life, right? It could be some dunya and some good stuff too, right? Some spirituality. La ilaha illallah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm sorry. I long for these things. Please make dua for my family. They are such patient people. They put up with me. Subhanallah. Sometimes I get lost in this stuff and go overboard. You know? And they tolerate me. Subhanallah. May Allah bless those lovely, lovely women. MashaAllah. They put up with a lot. <laughs> MashaAllah. Sugar on grits. That's country. Salt and pepper and grits with butter. Sugar don't go on grits. <laughs> My official fatwa. If you come to the cookout and you put sugar on your grits, you will be put in the basement and fed to the lions. <laughs> sugar on grits. <laughs> Allah. Yeah, funny. And I like that. I see you relating to other and having fun and brotherhood and sisterhood from all over the country. That's another blessing of these sessions. People don't know one another. They meet each other. They share and they are, mashallah, that's brotherhood in Islam and sisterhood in Islam. We need to love each other. We need to learn to love each other and be like one body, right? When one is hurting, the other is hurting. When one is happy, the other is happy. That's the deen. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. But don't that, grits go on cream of wheat. I don't get the grits and, I mean, sugar goes in cream of wheat, not grits. I don't get where you, Wafia, where did you get that from? That's weird. No, I mean, I know people do it. I saw y'all arguing about it, but it's, I would have never imagined it. Sugar, cream of wheat. Grits, salt. <laughs> She said, I don't even know where grits are. I'll tell you grits. This is sidetrack. This is scattered thoughts part two. If you ever go I, down south, I, I'm Midwest, I don't know. Where's Memphis at? Midwest? Yeah, Midwest, somewhere. I don't know. South, I don't know where Memphis is at. But Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Sheikh Hamza Abdul Malik. Uh, you got to go see him. It's Masjid, it's Midtown Mas, and they have Mi'raj Academy where they got a Quran school. Sheikh Hamza Abdul Malik. He was the one who did the Quran recitation at Muhammad Ali's funeral. He's a graduate of Al Azhar, African American brother. He's a friend of mine, very good friend of mine, right? Uh, he took me, he took us several imams, Midwest, South, right? He took me to um, uh, to a restaurant. So if you ever go down there, he got to take you. He's a good brother, mashallah, a beautiful community there. They're doing great work. 
uh, he took us to a restaurant and it was the first time I saw it because I'm from Jersey. They got, they have yellow grits. I thought it was butter in the grits. No, the grits are yellow. Delicious. <laughs> so, so, I don't know where else they might have that. That's where I saw it. So, because we have white grits here. They're white. But in Memphis, it's yellow grits. Man, it's delicious. I thought it was just all butter. I said, he said, no, that's not butter. That's the grits. Y'all ever saw yellow grits? Yeah. Okay, corn grits versus hominy grits. Okay, yeah, he did tell me something like that. I thought y'all want to learn knowledge. Y'all flaming up the knobs. Everybody want grits. Yeah, so you got to go see it. You got to... And if you like Quran, Abdul Qadir, you should go to Memphis because you want to do some Quran things. You should go to Memphis and see their community. He's doing an excellent job. And he's doing a Quran school and they rolling. He's, he's doing an excellent job, Sheikh Hamza, in Memphis, Tennessee. Excellent job. That's something I suggest you, Kofis. Like, maybe one day we all take a trip down there when it's... I got to go back because it's very nice. Uh, we go visit him. And we need to visit each other and support one another, inshallah. Uh, Ramadan's over. It's eating time. You guys is uh, 20 minutes talking about grits and cream of wheat and didn't we just get finished fasting? Where's all these knobs coming back from? <laughs> all right, so we're going to have grits. So we already know what's going to be on the menu. For breakfast, when we come for the 10th, July 10th, so get it early, free breakfast. We're going to have the fried fish, because he said fish. Aisha, Sister Aisha is the fish master. So we're going to have fried fish. We're going to have grits, country biscuits, pancakes, French toast, waffles, halal turkey bacon, halal uh, beef bacon, halal, well, everything's halal. You know that. So sausage, sausage patties. Scrambled eggs, cheese eggs, uh, boiled eggs, smoothies, smoothies. We're going to put it, we're going to have, no, we do that, people. I'm serious. We're going to have some fun. Masjid Muhammad is not a stingy masjid. We, 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 we have, we lay it out. You will enjoy. Anyone who's been here will tell you that. Hospitality is on the top of our menu, serving the people. We take joy in it, right? Our, our, our sisters are amazing in that area. Yeah, July 10th, everyone's coming to Atlantic City. We're gonna have a big, huge barbecue, events, we're gonna, we're gonna have some fun. Inshallah. Mashallah. So we're gonna we gonna, we're gonna have a fun. You'll enjoy it. You will, it will be something you won't regret. You won't forget. You'll enjoy it here. Oh, I'll do that this week. I'm sorry I got busy. I mean the hotels is easy. I'm uh, once I'm I could get hotels anywhere. That's not a hard thing. I just got busy and didn't get to do it. Oh, Imam Naeem comes here and eats two plates and three plates. Uh, Imam Naeem knows how we get down. He loves it. He travels all the way from Pittsburgh regularly. We used to be like every month when we 
when when the pandemic is not, we do seminars with sheikhs almost every month. We bring sheikhs from all over, overseas. And every every month or every other month, we have an all weekend with a scholar, and we cover books. So Imam Naim comes here all the time. Like, but the pandemic, we couldn't do anything because you know. But soon as it's over, we go back. We would have in one year. 12, 13, 17 scholars coming from all over the world to teach. We open it up. We have fun, mashallah. So you'll see, you'll be a part of our family. We'll be a part of your family. We'll visit you. You'll visit us. We'll come to your communities. You'll come to our communities. Brothers and sisters, that's how we do it. Toya, may Allah reward you all. I appreciate your brotherhood and your sisterhood and your family. I love you all. May Allah reward you. Barakallahu fikum. Wa jazakumullahu khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.